Step right up. Step right up. Spin the wheel. The moment our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for... T.M.I. Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your hosts. Jeff. Nerf Herder Chandler, Jim Kaiju Baker, and Christina Yojimbo Henry. You can continue. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. Not only that, like even the newbie, that 20 minute newbie with the Maria Menudos or whatever her name is, mm-hmm. like that's now like a 10 minute. And all it is is like Coke ads, Coke and M&M's. And they don't play even your, like you know, behind. play your space game app for yes, 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen anybody actually no. break out their phone? Even if I had this on my phone, I wouldn't do it in the theater. It's so I'd funny like, that you say that because <laughs> my son said the same thing the last time. He was like, nobody ever does this. Yeah, I know. Oh, do no. you ever hear anybody say, go oh, take out your phone. They're doing it. They're doing it. Right, you're correct. Here it comes. Speaking of changing, how many times do we talk about possibly doing this main feature before we actually had? I know this is um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we never say hi. We just, <laughs> we just drop the mic. Welcome to TMI, Confessionals yes. of the Nerd Kind. I'm Jeff. <laughs> and I'm Jim. And I'm Christina. Hey, that may hey. be a first. <laughs> <laughs> that may be a first right there. Welcome everyone who is listening. And I know there are people listening because I've been getting feedback. I hope it's good feedback. <laughs> uh, wanna, it, it, so far, so good. Yes. She's, she may be I'm wary of feedback. Feed- we do ask for it. Yeah, we feedback, do ask for it. Actually, listen, a, a five-star review or any kind of review is going to help us. And oh, yeah. I'd love that kind of feedback. To, I'd love no that kind of feedback. To help us. That's the only way we can kind of like elevate ourselves so that more people can see us and, and listen to us. As a person who has written 16 books that have gone out into the world and heard a wide range of opinions on we all those books. Them? We don't want them? Is that what you're saying? No, I can tell you that after a while, you're just like, okay, like that's yeah. a, it's, a review is a person's opinion and an opinion yes. is not necessarily based in it's not like rooted in some kind of fact right it's emotional um it has to do with so many different factors and it's fine because our whole show is opinion yes, our whole it show is, is very much so. and i very much hope that if ever one of the filmmakers listened to our podcast that they would not take it personally and that they take would umbrage. understand <laughs> that they would understand that yeah. The show is just the opinions of the people who watch these movies. And we put these reviews out there, hopefully for our listeners entertainment value, but ultimately they're just our opinions. And if you think you're interested in the movie and you haven't seen it, then, you know, maybe it'll encourage you to go see it yourself and form your own opinion. I hope Bruce Campbell is listening after our Black Friday (laughs) review. (laughs) Please understand, Mr. Campbell. He's not returned your phone calls. Is that what you're saying? He is not. He is not. Wow. But as you said, Jeff, this movie, the main feature that we are covering today has been elusive. Uh. Nightmare Alley which got a theatrical release, unfortunately opened against No Way Home. And due to the pandemic and not a lot of older people, which is what this uh, this movie's demographic is based upon. A lot of older people aren't going to the movies. It's finally in HBO Max. So we are covering Nightmare Alley this week. I will say it is back in theaters in a black and white version, which we will talk about a little bit, because I think, you know, um, Christina alluded to it last week, which is the fact that color play is pretty large into the look and feel of this movie. It does. So I, I, you know, I'm with you on. I'm curious how the black and white, if knowing Del Toro, if he went in and and tweaked it, you know, if he's blown out or if it's just a, a, a straight translation, because. 
there are points where it's very monochromatic mm. and I don't know how that I, I have read a couple of reviews where people walked into the theater not realizing that they were seeing the black and white version and were very disappointed. Uh, well, you know, the obvious touchstone is that it's a film noir and it's a remake of a of a 1940s movie starring Tyrone Power. So there's that connection. But, yeah, I agree that I can't see how it would be stronger in black and white. And that's what that's why you would want to do something like this. Like the, the, another example of a, a movie that's done this is The Mist, which I think actually benefited from the black and white transfer. I don't know if either of you have seen both no. versions, but I saw the, the color version. Yeah. Um, but it's so devastating. It's hard to watch again. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It that, is. Was, that was one of the hardest movies for me to I like just to get it out of my head. That's, tough. that's a stinger tail ending. And right? that's yeah, tough that's to watch true. again because I've said before that sometimes if I watch a movie more than once, there's something in the back of my head saying maybe it'll end differently. The, <laughs> the no, mist no, will never end differently. And you see like, that coming and it's it's kind of a downer. Uh, it, it, it makes the, and it's death. a great it's a it's a really good adaptation of a Stephen King short story. Definitely. But. It makes it less fun. That devastating ending makes the ride less fun but it's a still a good movie i'm very torn about the mist I'm it's a great movie it. but it's not something that you're like let me rewatch this yeah can you can you turn it off right at the very <laughs> like right it's before sort of that like, scene i don't know if you guys have ever seen the anime grave of the fireflies which is possibly the saddest movie ever made oh, let's, um, let's review it and it's one of those things where it's <laughs> like you watch it you're like, wow, that was a phenomenal work of art. And let me never do this again, you know, yeah. because it's just so devastating. Mm. On a lighter note, <laughs> we are pairing Nightmare Alley with. Well, Nightmare Alley is about a con man. As I mentioned last week, I wanted to do a little con man counter programming, something that was a little bit lighter. And so I picked Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And the interesting parallel here is that Nightmare Alley is a remake of an old film that is based on a book and so is Dirty Rotten Scoundrels which is also a remake of a book of a film that was based on a book yeah and this is uh showing my hand a little bit a delightful (laughs) um film shot by Frank Oz um from 1988 Mm. so before we get into Nightmare Alley Dude, what do we have in terms of news? Oh, uh, we got some nightmare news. Uh, once again, here we go. The dead keep marching. Uh, our beloved DJ, Johnny Fever, has signed off for the last time. Mm. Howard Hesman has passed away at the age of 81 from complications from uh, colon surgery last year. Uh, obviously, he was a uh, star of uh, WKRP in Cincinnati and head of the class. I was going to say, you know, it was weird as we watched this as Spinal Tap on Friday and we forgot that he was in it. He was in it. For like, he's in it for like a minute. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, WKRP in Cincinnati was a staple in my household growing up. I I think half the jokes went over my head at the time. It was pretty racy. Uh, did they ever release that on DVD? I know that I know that. There I'm was sure they did. Music. I'm sure they did. And Howard Hessman, and I, I'm sorry, but I didn't look this up, so I don't know the name of the troupe, but he was part of a comedy troupe and. He um, did the rounds on talk shows in the early 70s. Um, I'd often see him because I love watching stuff like Nick at Night and old Dick Cavett shows and old Tonight shows and stuff. And he was on there quite a lot. And I'm sure that's Mm. probably what led him to his sitcom success. Yeah, colon surgery, unfortunately. So uh, public service announcement, kid, uh, get your colonoscopy. Uh, FYI, WKRP in Cincinnati, the complete series is available on DVD. Yeah, with all the music intact? It says the complete series. There was issues with, it's been released a couple times, but like butchered because they didn't have the rights to a lot of the music. I'm sure that's that's probably what you see, yeah. That whole cast of characters, it was like a Barney Miller type ensemble piece. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, I I was never a Lonnie Anderson fan. I was more of Bailey. You know, of course I was a little kid, but uh, (laughs) everyone remembers the turkey drop episode. But also because it comes up every year on social media. Like oh, literally every drop, year yeah. you see somebody mention it on yeah. Thanksgiving. According to this, it is the Shout Factory edition that oh, nice. mostly, mostly retains okay. there you go. So the songs. There's a few that still exist due to licensing issues, songs from bands like the Beatles. 
but apparently the Shout Factory did a really good job of retaining the original music cue. So if you okay. want to see W Carapy in Cincinnati, mostly like you saw in your childhood, um, the Shout Factory DVD box set exists. There you go. Oh, that's good. All right. Totally. Public service announcement right there. There you go. Colonoscopy, yeah. Shout Factory. In that order. <laughs> uh, next up, we have a celebrity grudge match. Uh, apparently, Scooby-Doo has a, a bone to pick with James Gunn. Have we heard about this? No. No. Okay. Well, according to uh, James Gunn's Twitter account, he was contacted by his old friend Scooby, who is more than a little confused as to why he's not heard from the director since their time together. Uh, if you do not know, James Gunn uh, was screenwriter for the original two live action Scooby-Doo movies in the early 2000s. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, uh, but I will read a little snippet just so you get a little sense of this. And uh, I, uh, apologies. This is my best Scooby-Doo right here. Did you arrange your phone number? I rexted you a few times, but haven't heard back. Why haven't you put me in your superhero movies? I'm a rocking dog. Pop me in a suicide squad or something. Imagine throwing that starfish at old pal Scoob. Comes out of nowhere and ratches it. The crowd would go insane. I mean, you have a rocking tree, a regal, a shark, but no Scoob? So, <laughs> Scooby-Doo was very upset that James Gunn has not hired him. Is this a real thing? This is a real thing. It is on his Twitter. They're, they're accrediting the- On the- Scooby-Doo's Twitter? No, it's on James Gunn. But apparently, uh, the, the rumor is, is that First of all, it's a handwritten note. And he goes on and talks about, you know, I know I know you, you you think it's weird that a dog can't answer the phone, but I just typed this letter. It took me six hours, but I did it. Uh, ben Schwartz is being credited with this letter. He has sent out numerous letters over the last couple months um, to various creatives in character. And this is I just found this amusing as all I get out. So Scooby Doo. <laughs> Scooby Doo. <laughs> Wants to work with James Gunn again. <laughs> or Mr. Schwartz wants yes. to work with James Gunn. Either one. One of the two. Oh, that is true. That might be the bigger. <laughs> yeah. And that's all the news I have this week, kids. Unless you have anything else you brought to the table. Well, I have two things. Oh, all right. I sent them to you. Well, at least one of them to you this week, which is my favorite topic. Scream has been is getting yet another sequel. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Where can they go? I already told you what's going to happen. Then these twins. No, it's going to be Stu because we know he's alive, right? That's, that's right. the fan theory. Stu's it's going to be Stu. So that's out there. Always have high hopes. At least I do. Scream sequel has been greenlit. The other thing that I just read this morning, Moonfall, which we have widely. <laughs> we have, I wasn't uh, even going to bring this up. We have wisely swerved to avoid. Apparently is so bad. It's coming in second to Jackass this weekend. And it's open. Jackass weekend. is being hailed as a masterpiece, by the way. <laughs> so you know that. The- in comparison. <laughs> the- in comparison. <laughs> now, that's funny I because know. I have a couple of news items and they both okay. uh, involve Moonfall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> not the not the box office underperformance, mind you. I just caught a Yahoo headline, and this is this is the headline. Could the moon ever be pushed from orbit like in Moonfall? No, no. <laughs> the answer is no. I just say yeah, because the, the Nazi base on there was going to. Yeah, you can't do that. Now, this this assumes a couple of things. This article first, that the person reading is an idiot. Yes, <laughs> It's a slow and day. that anybody would know what Moonfall is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did see an article where they ruined the ending. Like, apparently they don't even care. Well, nobody cares. Um, they, the, they, the, they act, the actor, the main actor was was surprised at the twist ending. And I'm like, just when you think it was absurd, it gets even more absurd. Mm-hmm. So I think we did dodge a bullet. We dodged a giant crater. Yeah. I also read that it cost $130 million to make, which Woo! makes it one of the most expensive independently financed films of all time. And it is not even remotely going to make its money mm-hmm. back. So well, I can't wait for it to drop on social media because I will be watching it. And the other bit that I saw related to Moonfall was uh, an interview with director Roland Emmerich. The impetus of this interview and the headline was Marvel and Star Wars are ruining movies. It was his opinion. What? Again, too easy. I don't even know if I want to make a joke about this. So um, we'll just leave it at that. I mean, should we talk about his body work? Or... 
<laughs> we need to. Uh, He's destroyed pretty much everything. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be too negative. I don't want to go into libel territory. <laughs> <laughs> I worry now. No, it's as J. Jonah, it's slander, isn't it? If it's spoken, it's not libel. That is true. That's yeah. true. Well, and uh, I got nothing much to add to that. So, <laughs> whatever. Out okay. Control. All right. Let's go. Let's news let's out. This, Nightmare let's Alley. Alley. Now, Christina, have you ever seen the Tyrone Power version of yes. Nightmare Alley? I believe, okay. I believe she said last week she not only saw the other version, she read the book. Yes. So she comes All right. So you are you are fully prepared. Um, but I'll wait until you guys uh, weigh in. Um, there, there's some pretty significant changes from the book to the 47 film. And then what was really interesting to me was that it's very clear that Guillermo del Toro really did not go back to the book for his version. He literally remade the 47 film because his version is significantly longer. It's like 40 minutes longer. Two um, and a half hours. Which, which I think is, a, is a, one of the negatives of this film. I don't think it's paced correctly for the material. No. But and it does pain me to, it pains me to say anything about negative about Guillermo <laughs> because I love him. But um, I don't think this film was paced correctly for the material. But it's re- important to note that he, it's, he if you watch the Tyrone Power version of this film and you watch the new film, there's really just sort of beat for beat. That's what Guillermo did. He remade the film. He didn't go back really to the source material. Can you just take me through for one minute? So when did the book come out? The so the novel? book came out in 46 okay, and the Tyrone so Power film only came out a year later. So they jumped oh, okay. on oh, this. So they jumped wow. on getting that movie okay. out. I mean, just to give you like a little bit of quick background because it is relevant. So Guillermo del Toro has long been a fan of this, the original film and the original film was quite obscure. It was really known only to like a very small contingent of noir fans partially because when the film was made, the studio head, which was Daryl Zanuck at the time, absolutely hated the idea of this movie. Tyrone Power had read the book. He was in love with it. He wanted to do this part. He had been known up until that point for playing like really sort of happy-go-lucky characters. He was in all these kind of light adventure films and romantic comedies, but he had been in World War II. And when he came home, he just wanted to do more serious material. And Zanuck greenlit the project, gave it what was known as a picture money. So, you know, it had longer shooting time, it had, you know, bigger budget, had an A-list director, but he literally tried to tank the film when he came, when it came out because he thought the material was seedy and that Tyrone Power was wasting himself on this project. So they did, he did everything he could to make sure that the film got a limited release and that it didn't make a lot of money. Um, So this was kind of a project that sort of was very obscure for a long, long time. But Guillermo del Toro was a huge, huge fan of this film. And this is a del Toro movie in every sense of the word. He has such a visual style that is unmistakable and it's present here. Now, let's just go over the plot really quick. Bradley Cooper plays Stan, who is running from his past, running from his family, running from a burning house in the beginning of the movie. Um, And he gets on a bus and he finds a carnival and um, he meets Willem Dafoe, who plays Clem, who's the, the head of the carnival, gives him a job and he ingratiates himself into the the lives of some of the carnies. And he learns the craft of being a mentalist a fake mentalist, but a mentalist nonetheless. And he sees that he can um, make money off of this by taking advantage of some poor souls. So that's what he does. He leaves the carnival. He brings Molly along with him. She's the electric woman at the carnival who lets current run through her as a sideshow. And he gets involved in the wrong people as he's giving private readings. Um, Kate Blanchett and Richard Jenkins among them. So that's the movie in a nutshell, the downfall of this character of Stan played by Bradley Cooper. So one thing too, I want to mention. So the book and both films are framed by this idea of the geek. And 
William Lindsay Gresham, who wrote the book, and he went to fight as a foreign national in the Spanish Civil War. One of the other soldiers had been a carny and told this story about the man they call the geek at these 10 and one shows. And the geek is usually a late stage alcoholic. And they would bring this guy in and they would say, look, we just want you to pretend to do this. Okay. Um, we'll give you somewhere to sleep. You'll have a bottle every day. You'll have meals. You know, all you have to do is take a chicken or a snake. You'll have a little razor in your hand. You slit the throat so nobody can see. You put some blood on your face, make it look like you're eating the blood. And what would happen was after a couple of weeks, they would say to the guy, well, we can't have you anymore. We have to get rid of you because we need a real geek. We need someone who will actually bite the heads off the chickens and the snakes. The person would then be so desperate that they would start doing it for real. So it's a ter- it was a terrible thing. <laughs> it is terrible. Now, because uh, I was watching this, they, they have the poor guy at the beginning. Willem Dafoe's character of Klim goes through this whole rigmarole of how you suck in this poor guy, put some opium in, a, in the shot that you give him and get him hooked on drugs. Uh, so not only um, wave the money over his head, but get him hooked on drugs and throw him in a cage. And he's in the cage when he's not performing. Wouldn't it be better if he was just in on the joke, if he was just, you know, put on his clothes after he, he did his act and then he'd be he happy, the right? Yeah, unfortunately, he is the joke. This is how Ozzy got his start, by the way. William Lindsay Gresham was so haunted by this story, he couldn't stop thinking about it. So when he came home from Spanish Civil War, he wrote this book using the geek as the framing device for the story. One of the things I watched for this was um, a little documentary which was a sideshow historian talking about the history of sideshows. And he said that normally you would not see geeks in the bigger kinds of shows, the ones that had a lot of money. You would see them in what he called a ghillie show, which were like these smaller carnivals that were a little seamier. They didn't have as much money. They were a little more desperate and they needed some big spectacular performance to draw people in. That's where you usually saw the geeks. Uh, it's not drawing me in. I, I, I hated those freak shows. I will say this this opening carnival scene is beautiful. He really captures that 40s look and feel. And we talked earlier about the color palette and the, the soft colors that really just kind of frame these characters throughout as you're meeting all these kind of you know but it's a del Toro carnival at the same time. It is unmistakably del toro the, i didn't see uh, a guy swimming in a tank though the fun house and i say that very loosely the fun yeah, house no, that was not fun the where they're actually looking for the geek at the beginning because he gets out and they're going through the fun house and stan goes in and he's walking through it the visual of the tunnel that's turning with the spiral is that was just such an indelible del toro image right there but also it was obvious where this was going the end of the movie spending so much time on the geek in the beginning and Stan just ruminating on it. Like the wall, that's how he's going to end up at the, at the end of this. Well, the the fact that we had to sit for an hour and 45 minutes in between before it got to them was a little laborious. Well, that's, that's the thing. This is what I mean. So when we walked out of this film, I said immediately to my husband and son, I know why this film isn't doing well. And it's because he paced it all wrong. I think this is a a thing where he loved the material so much and he just wanted to put every single thing that he loved into Into this film. And I'm not saying it like, is it a bad film? No. Could it have been a great film? Yes. I don't think it's a great film. And I think that he loved it so much and he just wanted to put everything in. Like some scenes just go on like a little too long you're like okay you've made your point let's move on to the next thing and i think that what happens though it's a noir so a noir should feel you should feel this tension ratcheting up throughout the film like this the inevitable doom of the main character you know the inevitable doom of the main character but you don't feel it the only time where i really felt tension was during the scene when he tries to run the the ghost scam on Grindel because 
you know, you know it's going to go wrong. Yes, that and, was know, unbearably tense. That's, that's that was last, unbearably tense. And that's <laughs> the, the last 20 minutes. Right, Richard Jenkins right. is so scary as that oh, character. Yeah, he doesn't right. have to do anything violent. No, you, you just, you the threat of it is to, there. You don't want the threat to of it is absolutely there. Yeah. And I think that because he has this really deliberate pacing, and like I said, every scene goes on a little bit too long, I think that it it doesn't have that inevitable feeling nor that feeling of the tension building right. and building right. and building yeah. and building that you should get with a noir. And I'm not saying a noir has to be fast paced because if you watch something like Out of the Past, which is sort of like the er noir film, many sections of that are very deliberately paced, but you definitely feel that the but it builds. main character it builds. is right, careening toward this inevitable yeah. end. I was with this with the exception of the Kate Blanchett scenes. I think mm-hmm. those could have been, if anything could have been cut back, it could have been that. I think that that was maybe, you know, we've got this actress in this part. Uh, Let, yes, let's correct. give her the That's, most yep. that we can. I agree with that. I want a more Mary Steen virgin personally, because I adore her. <laughs> um, my first and only note for this, this is a two and a half hour Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It, it just feels like, especially having watched the original film, and if you guys have a chance to watch it, I really recommend that you do, because you'll see what I mean, where the Del Toro's film doesn't necessarily, you know, do things significantly differently. He changes some scenes, obviously. Um, he adds a lot in that isn't present in the text or in the original film like stan does not kill his father in the book nor does he kill him in the original film um does he have father issues in the original film at least he has in the original film he um is an orphan in the book he has father issues but it was mostly related to the fact that his mother had an affair and like left them when he was young so and left him with his dad so That wasn't present. So he Del Toro added that the scenes with Lilith are in the book. They're in the original film, like in Del Toro's version, Lilith is running this huge con so she can get revenge on him for humiliating her, which is like absurd. Whereas in the book, she's just a flat out hustler. And that's what she is in the original movie. She sees him. She she considers him a mark. She uses him to get what she wants. Just see like that he- that works for me. That absolutely yeah. works for me because she was just too involved, and it it was just another character, another flavor that didn't need to be in this version it was of the very movie. Very convoluted. You know? Yeah. Whereas, like, if you look at the way Gresham wrote the book and where it, the way it plays out in the original film, Stan is trying to use Grindel to get what he wants. Right? He wants yeah. this big payoff. Lilith is using Stan to get what she wants, Mm -hmm. this big payoff. And there's a beautiful symmetry there. Whereas when you're adding like this extra layer of revenge, I feel like it doesn't have the same. Yeah, I thought that was very convoluted. I did not understand her motivations um, very well. Is the original widely available? Can you see it streaming, the 47 version? Well, I watched it on the Criterion channel. Um, I know it is available as a DVD, so you might be able to find it um, Mm. like in your library or something as the DVD. It's a criteria, the Criterion edition, which is nice and has um, a bunch of cool special features about the history of the film and um, about Gresham. It has the sideshow feature, which is really interesting. Um, So I think if you're interested in this, um, it's definitely worth seeking out. It's paced a little differently, obviously. But I think you'll realize when you're watching it that it sort of comes to the same conclusions. The only thing that the 47 version does, and I think this was a sop to the studio, is that it adds this chance of redemption for Stan at the end. Because it was 1947, Zanuck didn't want Tyrone Power to end on this life of the geek kind of thing. And so there's a little scene where he re-meets Molly and she says she's going to take care of him and save him. And that feels really tacked on because you can tell when he does the Mr. I was born for it line that that's a curtain line, right? That's right. the yeah. that's where the movie should end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they just couldn't bring themselves to do it because it was Tyrone Power. Did it have like the, the curtain drop? <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> like the should, end. Right? Dun, dun, yeah. Dun. yeah. 
And actually, in a, a perfect theme. example of a scene I think that goes on too long is at the end, Bradley Cooper is like laughing and laughing. And you're like, OK, the, the movie's over. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but, why is he still but, going? Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I guess Del Toro like that. He was very concerned about that scene. And Cooper was like, I will do whatever it takes to get what you need. And they did it in one take. First take. Done. Maniacal. Done. I'm gone. I'm out of here. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, but this is this whole movie goes on too long. There's so many things. It just goes on a little bit too long. So if you think about structurally in the book, it's a 275 page book. About 80 pages of it are at the carnival, a little less than a third. This movie spends almost an hour of a two and a half hour film at the carnival. So that's, you know, because visually that's where you want to be. Yeah. I don't want to see him, you know, he all these scenes with with the doctor in the in the office. And I don't care how suspenseful you think it is. I got caught up in watching the damn fake snow in the window. I do want to take this time to shout out my friend Frank, because I, last week we talked about how I was going to be able to see this. And my opportunities fell through and I was forced to then race over to my buddy's house and watch this on the 70 inch television. But when I got there. He had pizza, he had popcorn, and he had beer waiting for me. So okay. kudos to you, my friend. <laughs> he hooked me up. Um, Unfortunately, it wasn't a better movie for us to watch. Like I said, it really pains me to say that I didn't love this film because I wanted yeah. to love it. I saw it on the big screen. It's very beautiful. It's very atmospheric. Oh, um, gorgeous to look at. I think it's that it's not paced correctly. I just... <laughs> the hill i will die on it's, it's, it's not unfortunate correctly. It's, yeah it's a very unfortunate well, well uh, let's 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 talk about some specific things in the movie because mm-hmm. i what was really bothering me was the opening scene where um it's later revealed that he um he kills his father and then he burns the house down he puts his father in the floorboards now is he trying to make it look like it's not suspicious because he doesn't cover the father <laughs> that up. That would be that would be very suspicious. I'm like, just leave him in bed. Just leave his body in bed and then start the fire. <laughs> Did he not read the telltale mark? <laughs> <laughs> he under the floorboards. But because he puts him in a body bag as well before he, yeah, he burns so the funny. house down. I don't know. So then he goes to the carnival and then mm-hmm. he meets Willem Dafoe's Clem. And um, who's telling him the whole story of the geek after he sees the geek show himself. I'm like, I wouldn't trust this guy at some point, you know, mm-hmm. like I would be on the lookout for him to be slipping something into my drink at this <laughs> yeah. point. You don't know him. He's right. probably sizing you up right now to be the geek. Sure. But but yeah, so he attaches himself to Zena and Pete. Um, who are the mentalists of this little carnival. And they warn him off of doing what they call the spook show, which is trying to make people yeah. think that it's a real thing and that you're giving them hope. Because Zena does this to a woman at the carnival, says that she sees her um, her brother next to her, but then tells her afterwards, takes her aside that it wasn't real. That- right, because she got caught in the moment and she it's because Pete had messed up. Pete's an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And this is the other thing that the, the film does, which I don't like. So in the, the book, Stan puts the wood alcohol into Pete's existing bottle because he wants to knock Pete out. He's not trying to kill him. He wants to knock him out so that he can sleep with Xena. Okay. And in the 1947 film, it makes it out like he did it on purpose but again, it's not clear if his goal was to kill him or just to knock him out. But I, th- it, I think it's more obvious that he's trying to get rid of Pete because he's very in the 47 version. He's very nakedly ambitious here. I really dislike that they made it out to be like, I don't know, like it wasn't cl- like I wish they would have ascribed him with more motivation because you see the scene where he goes to the alcohol and like the Clem has made this big fuss, like the wood alcohol is on this side and the drinking (laughs) alcohol is on this side. Right. Right? Uh, So I think that as a visual, like they show you his back. And I think what I would have liked is to see him make a deliberate choice to, because you don't get that internal dialogue like you get in the book where you know that he's like, oh, I just want to knock him out so that me and Zena can go, right. you know, roll in the hay. He's not caught 
And because of that, it gives him this false confidence, which then projects through the rest of the book. And you don't see that here, but you already know this guy's a murderer. So right. it just, everything. Yeah. No. Completely but that life. was very ambiguous to me because I don't think that he had already slept with Zena. So right. I don't think that that was even on the table anymore. So and then he, he says a little bit it, yeah. later that it was an accident. But you know, it's not he could be lying. <laughs> right. It's not clear. And I think that actually, again, I think the the movie would have been better served if we had seen him make a choice, you know, because you're not privy to his thoughts. No. You know, you're not privy to his thoughts in that moment. It's very clear that he wants the book because as soon as Pete dies, he runs to where yeah. the book is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, nope. you know? got, got that. So yeah, I, 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 I thought there was motivation there. I thought he definitely was, was trying. But to I would have liked to see the film commit to the choice. Yeah. Is what I'm well, he committed to being naked. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, I think that Guillermo del Toro, if you've seen his other movies, you know, he loves creatures, right? Yes, yeah. He knows creatures who are, he loves creatures who are considered monstrous. He loves outsiders. I would have loved to have seen a original Guillermo del Toro story set in a carnival yeah. rather than see him remake mm. this existing material. I think he could have made an incredible carnival story. You almost got it with the baby in the pickle jar. Oh, geez. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to see him, like, I don't know. It was kind of cool. That, 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 was like, a, that was a classic like, Del Toro monster right there. The baby yeah, in the pickle the jar. One-eyed. Oh, I mean, don't you think if Del Toro had made his own carnival thing, like, maybe some of the creatures wouldn't have been fake? Like, maybe they would have been real fantastic yeah, creatures, yeah, right? Absolutely. And you could have had, absolutely. like, some really cool horror fantasy elements. And I just think it would have been amazing. Like, I... I think that's what keeps me from hating this movie on some level is because I can see how much he loves this material. I can kind of see what he wanted to do, but he's so caught up showing you so many things, you know, he sort of forgot the, the point of the movie. I think, you know what it's missing? Doug Jones. (laughs) <laughs> that's mm. right where's doug oh. jones yeah yeah he could exactly. have been the geek you could have put, put him in the geek role in the beginning i don't no one's brought this up yet but he has a history with these grifters and fake psychics do you know this story yeah about his, about dad. his parents his dad was abducted by yeah. like mexican cartel he was and kidnapped they, in 1998 his father was kidnapped and held for ransom and when uh, his parents contacted the police, the first thing they told him is be wary of psychics are going to come out of the woodwork. And sure enough, they did yeah. trying to convince the mom that they they knew where the dad was. They knew. So he's been carrying this. That's crazy stuff that you just to deal with these type of people. And uh, yeah, the other thing, too, and I think it's a little more unforgivable in Guillermo del Toro's version because it is so long is that both films really ignore Molly's backstory and they do nothing to round out her psychology. Um, It's so much more striking in the Del Toro film because it's a more modern film and you would hope that they would make, you know, round out a female character better, but also because it's so long and you're like, well, if you're going to make it so long, then add stuff back in from the book. But in the book, there's this backstory of Molly where when she was young, it was just her and her dad and her dad was a gambler and she hero worshiped him. And I feel like that is so important to the way that she attaches herself to Stan because she really hero worships Stan. And I feel like you don't get enough of the sense of what, where she's coming from, like why she falls in love with him in the first place and why she keeps staying with him, even when, even when she has doubts. And part of it is because she lived so long, just her and her dad and her dad Mm -hmm. was this guy who took chances. Right. And she sees that as attractive in some way. It's very unfortunate that they didn't just add that in. Yeah, because I liked her character. I did like her character. And it was because of her that I think that the ending was so tense because not knowing what the how the story was going to go. It was like good. She's out of there. She's out of this Jenkins clutches, you know, she's out of Grindel's clutches. But no, then he grabs her at the bus station and he convinces her to get in the dress. I'm like, this guy is never gonna do what you ask him. He's never gonna kneel and pray. 
just because right. you ask them to. She's yeah. on the chopping block now. Yeah. So I was so glad yeah. when she got away. Uh, it was that was terrible. Yeah, that right. ending. That, I was just that, like that, on the edge of my seat. <laughs> oh, and the minute he grabbed her, you're like, ah, no. That's the other thing. I think that again, like especially because the section where he's playing Stanton the Great kind of goes on for so long. Like, how many scenes do we need to see of him in the room blindfolded, right? Like, it just goes on and on. But in the book, he actually transitions from that to Reverend Carlisle, and he becomes Hmm. a spiritualist minister. In that context, it makes a lot more sense that Grindel would kneel because he brings Grindel in as a part of his church, like where he's convinced people that he's a a medium, but he's also a reverend and he like, he's connected to God. So this is all okay. And it's this elaboration of his con. That's what I mean when I say that Del Toro is clearly remaking the film, not going back to the book, not remaking, like not making that source material or adding stuff back in from the book. Anything that he's added into this version of the film is his own original stuff. It's not going back to the source material. Yeah, I, th- I agree with you. He should have just abandoned this all together and just came up with his own story. I just think he loved it. You know, I think he loved it so much. And obviously, when you win an Oscar, you know, or a bunch of Oscars, you, you, you have you a, can pretty much do whatever yeah, you want. Yeah. Right. You have a right to do whatever you want. Yeah. And that's you only get one chance to do that. And I'm sure he thought this is my one chance. If this is his only one misstep so far, it, I mean, I wouldn't even really... call it a misstep. I no, wouldn't go I, that no, far. But no, but we've raved about everything else this man touches. So. But yeah, poor Stan, you know, as a master grifter, he can't really read people that well. This definitely didn't read <laughs> Lilith that well, nor uh, nor Grindel as to what he was capable of. Uh, one of the great lines, you don't fool anyone. They fool themselves. That terrible scene with Mary Steenburgen when she mm. kills her husband and then kills herself just to be with the uh, son that he told yeah. her is trying to talk to them. That's oh. That's the thing. Stan's downfall comes because he remains convinced that because he runs the grift that he can't be grifted. Yeah. You know, he thinks he's smarter than everyone. He's too full of himself at that point. Yeah. He's yeah. believing his own BS. David, David Strathairn's character used a word. It was like star eyed or something. I can't remember at the beginning, basically like when you start to believe your own BS and that's what happens to Stan for sure. I wish in some sense that del toro had brought in this element from the book because i don't know what you guys assume the term nightmare alley means we never saw a nightmare or an alley clem says it it's like where he pulls the geeks from right which is not what it is in the book and which actually makes a lot more sense i think if you if they had found a way to incorporate this in the book stan says that he has this nightmare that he has over and over that he's in a dark alley and he's running toward the Uh. light and he can never get to the light. And that, that is what his life is, is that he's always stuck in the alley. He always wakes up before he reaches the light. You know, he's this character who's always seeking, he's trying to get somewhere and he can't get there. And obviously in this, the structure of the story He's, you know, he's functionally in the darkness the whole time, right? He never achieves what he wants to achieve. And in fact, at the end, he's actually, you know, on the downslope. Interesting thing about this is Leonardo DiCaprio was attached first to the role of Stan and then had to back out. And then Bradley Cooper came on. It's not hard to see him in many roles. And I could see him here doing this, but especially after seeing the uh, Shutter Island. Didn't do great at the box office. Uh, it cost sixty million to make, and it's made twenty three million thus far. Mm. There's one other thing I wanted to mention, which is that I really felt, even though this is shot very beautifully and obviously designed very beautifully, that this is the least seedy carnival that I've ever seen. <laughs> and it's so um, significant. I actually, have the book here. I want to read a little thing to you, just to see what you think if del toro captured this sense in the film and i don't think he did and again i think that this is kind of a downfall of the of the movie but um dust when it was dry mud when it was rainy 
swearing, steaming, sweating, scheming, bribing, bellowing, cheating, the carny went its way. It came like a pillar of fire by night, bringing excitement and new things into the drowsy towns, lights and noise and the chance to win an Indian blanket, to ride on the Ferris wheel, to see the wild man who fondles those reptiles as a mother would fondle her babes. Then it vanished in the night, leaving the trodden grass of the field and the debris of popcorn boxes and rusting tin ice cream spoons to show where it had been. No, not even close. I, Del Toro romanticized his version of. Well, yeah, all these people. characters, yeah. with the exception of the geek, were like lovable scamps, mm-hmm. uh, you know, scams, at the yeah. And that's yeah. one thing that's really present in the book is that sort of steaming, scheming, sweating, you know, that what kind you of think. Yeah, that's, you know, yeah, and that that's what you think. And that was why Zanuck really, really didn't want this to be made into a film, especially with his golden boy. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, he's because- trying to do him a favor, in other words. <laughs> Right. Right. This book was actually censored in a lot of places because content was considered shocking, even though, you know, noir books had existed. Another little trivial side note, unfortunately, William Lindsay Gresham may be mostly famous because of his marriage and divorce to the poet Joy Davidman, who later went on to marry C.S. Lewis. And the film Shadowlands is about her marriage to C.S. Lewis. Her two sons, who she had with William Lindsay Gresham, were later the inheritors of C.S. Lewis's estate. He adopted them. Jeez. So. (laughs) Thanks, stepdad. (laughs) Did they get the wardrobe? uh, The only fun fact I have is that uh, Willem Dafoe's wife played the spider woman. I heard Del Toro talking about that, and he said that that moment was something he had seen in a real carnival when he was a kid. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, I guess as a little kid, you'd be like blown away. Yeah, I I, uh, I don't like those things at all. I don't I, I still have nightmares as a kid. My grandfather taking us to the uh, county fair and they would always have just I mean, not like alligator people or anything like that, but just enough that it was like unsettling. And you know, even the, the even down to the, the art. Yeah, I know. Even down to the nasty airbrushed amateurish art that's on like on the side of the fun yeah. house and everything else hey artists it's, need to make a living as well it's, but it's all seedy it's so seedy it's looking. all you're artistic right. interpretation you get in there like she doesn't look like that at all just a tall guy with a dog so, okay so this might be difficult but what kind of buckets would we give to oh, nightmare man. alley yeah this is tough like uh, you, you know we mentioned it's beautiful to look at it is I, it I, is I, I say bradley cooper does a fantastic job and you know, and to, to Christina's point, yeah, I think it could have probably used a good 30, 40 minutes edited out. But yes. still, it caught me at the end. I was really on the edge of my seat at the end with all those Grindel scenes. So it delivered. So I'm going to go three and a half. And it gave me that Del Toro fix. Well, you mentioned, you know, that fun house and he's walking through the, the rotating tube or whatever. And it's got the spiral effect with a giant eyeball on the other side. And all I thought of was, was the outer limits, the opening graphics of the outer limits. So visually, it, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I love the carnival scenes. And like you said, the last 15 minutes really kind of, you know, you, you're on the edge of your seat. But in between, it just sags. It, I'm going two and a half. I'm going to go right between you guys and say three mm-hmm. It's just OK. It's it's so hard when you see a film where a filmmaker clearly has so much passion for the material and all the actors are talented and everybody has clearly like put their A plus effort into it and the product doesn't deliver. But I just think the editing is not tight enough and it's to the detriment of the film. Mm-hmm. Is this like a Stephen King scenario where you're just so big that people just allow you to do whatever and no one really gives you oversight and all of a sudden you put out a 1600 page book no one has the balls to tell you you need to edit out five chapters i actually feel like this is very akin to peter jackson's king kong which came out after he'd won the oscar for return of the king and it was the same thing whatever give him whatever he he wants he'd won the oscar and he always wanted to make king kong and he just put everything he wanted into that film and I think in Peter Jackson's case, it comes off a little better just because it's a more active film. But it's still a lot of people Mm. were like the originals, like what? That may be that may be a little harsh to say, though. It's not like he made Moonfall, Mr. Del Toro. No, no, no. Like like everybody's saying, wait a second. (laughs) No, no, no. I'm not saying like it means that the product is garbage. It just means that like 
nobody's putting the reins on this person because they've right. gotten that's they've was. like i said they won an oscar they've achieved this thing and this is like their one shot to do this one big passion project that they always wanted to do and they go overboard because they just love it too much it's too close you know, to them you know who doesn't go overboard frank oz mm-hmm. Ooh, nice segue so let's yeah, go to nice. the concession stand we'll be right back with dirty rotten scoundrels Right this way, just step right into the greatest show on earth. In the center ring, our top attraction, you get your money's worth. Come see the dancing elephants, the biggest thing on wheels. All the little boys for circus, I wonder how it feels. With wonder does this magic land fill his white eyes. Look now, there's the zebras, this show's a real surprise. The polar bears arrive on cue, on bikes they sally forth. They're mighty cool, but then it's true, they're from the frozen north. And now the clowns will stop the show with your most kind permission. A rocket blast, so you will know it's time for intermission. Okay, we are back. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, 1988. This is a Christmas movie. It came out December 14th. I did see this in the theater. Well paired, you did. by the way. I really enjoyed watching this again. Yeah, there's, listen, I've got family and friends who we do the Rupert thing, you know, may I go to the bathroom, please? Now, and I knew this, but I'd forgotten over the ravages of time uh, that this was the backstory. This was written originally for David Bowie and Mick Jagger. I yeah. could not believe that when I read that. <laughs> was this after the Dancing in the Streets video? And they're like, it was. give these guys a movie. That's they're exactly what together. it was. That's it was crazy. like they were on a roll after that. And it's like, well, maybe they, they would be good in a movie together. And they were actually looking for a vehicle because they're both actors, right? Um, you do Free Jack? He did Free Jack. He did performance. That's a very well, that's a very lauded film from uh, 1970. But um, yeah, so they were looking for a vehicle and Bowie ended up doing Last Temptation of Christ instead. So this kind of fell by the wayside, never became a Bowie Jagger vehicle. Steve Martin and Michael Caine are perfect. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and Michael Caine is it did occur to me that he is doing that 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 Brixton Bromley Bowie-esque accent when he's talking in his normal speaking voice. I'm like, that's very mm-hmm. Bowie-esque. And then it dawned on me, this Cosmic was supposed movie. to be a David Bowie movie. That's crazy. And the late, wonderful Glenn Headley as Janet slash the Jackal. Is she I late? Real, I didn't realize that she had passed away. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I adored she, her in this. She's, of course, there's a little Chicago connection here. She was originally a Steppenwolf ensemble member. So this is kind of big news in Chicago when she passed away. Um, oh. She had a she had a sudden, I think it was a pulmonary embolism um, about four nice. years ago. She was only in her early sixties. She was quite young. Wow. Um, she was actually in the middle of filming something, a TV show, I mm. think. Um, but she's so so delightful in this. Uh, you know, I just think she's the perfect foil for these two. Oh. Yes, yeah. Tess Trueheart. It's Glenn Headley. She was in Dick Tracy as well. Oh, yeah. But yeah, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, December 88. It's direct competition was both twins and Scrooged. So it was in a crowded cinematic landscape back in December of 1988. But held its own, cinematic. held its own. Yeah, we have two con men here. So you get two for the price of one. Michael Caine plays Lawrence Jameson, and he is very much... The posh, wealthy con man, the high class con man who goes after very um, distinguished marks, very rich American women. And Freddie Benson, played by Steve Martin, is the baser of the two con men. He's just trying to get a free meal out of whoever he can scam it from. And once these two, once fate brings them together, Freddie sees Lawrence as kind of a teacher. And Lawrence doesn't want anything to do with Freddie, but circumstances just just keep bringing them back together on the French Riviera. And it is a delight. And I was surprised that even in that late 80s age where um, movies were going into R and PG-13 territory, that this maintained a PG rating. Yeah, there's really nothing bought you. No, there's not. Nothing. No, there's no language. This is enjoyable as all hell. Steve Martin's con is so crude. You can't believe it works. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah, because he just plays like the the, the country doofus. He's just do. Whereas I, it was really interesting. I was thinking about this. Michael Caine's character is actually a little more moral 
in a sense. Absolutely. Freddy. Especially yeah. towards the end. He's like, this he, is, yeah, this is not the right thing to do. He yeah. says, though, he only takes money from wealthy women, right? And this is what it is. He gives them a little bit of fantasy, right? Uh-huh. He gives them a little memory they can take home. And he they give him what amounts to a trinket usually like a piece of jewelry and they go on their way. Yes. He's stealing. He's conning them, but it seems sort of harmless because <laughs> these are like, so stealing, you know, but it's harmless. It is because they get something out of it. Do you know what I mean? They get like this feeling like, Oh, they have this little romantic fling with he's, the prince feeding to their ego. Right? Yeah. And then they go home and then they never think of it again. And he doesn't take, I think more than they can give. It's not like a long term con, um, so there's something about his method that just seems the movie makes it seem very chaste as well, because you're never, you know, really aware if he's there's a sexual relationship with between him and these women. Isn't there a scene with him and Barbara Harris where they're in bed and she gives him something? You just see, yes, you yeah. see them. There they, is. They're, they're yeah. in bed. Together. OK, OK. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah. I got the impression that he was. Yeah. Fulfilling their little uh, old lady again, desires. Again, he's just giving them a little bit of fantasy, right? It's just a little <laughs> fantasy. And then they, is that what he calls it? Just as a little then, fantasy? He doesn't call it. That's what I call it. I just <laughs> I just feel like it's sort of. So he's doing it for their benefit. Is what... <laughs> well, that's there's no, there's no misogyny here whatsoever. He's doing it for their benefit. And... That's right. Oh, no. There's a little misogyny for sure. <laughs> but I think that's what the great thing about this film is, is that Janet gets them both at the end because again, they're the grifters who think they can't be grifted. Yeah. And I yeah. love the fact that she is the jackal. So for the, for yes, the most of the movie, to believe that you think it's Steve Martin's character, that Lawrence assumes that Freddie is the jackal. He could never be the jackal. You know, no. he is, well, that's, he's not smart enough to be the jackal. Well, I think that was his, his problem was like, how is this guy that like, got a reputation for this? But <laughs> what I love about this movie is that none of these characters learn their lesson. No one changes. No one suddenly has a change of heart and becomes a different character. You know, even at the end, when they, when the two of them realize that they've been scanned by her, like they're on the cusp of like, wait a minute. And then she comes back and they're like, you know, she drags her right into another scam. And I'm like, they're just going to continue doing it now. Now they just double down because now they got another partner. Lawrence, though, when he finds out she scammed him, he's just fallen in love in that moment. Yeah, like, sure, because he's found his equal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, more so. You know, his better. You know, and he's yeah. he just starts laughing. He's like, she's wonderful. Yeah, and it's yeah. so different from again from Freddie's response, where Freddie is so angry that he <laughs> could be scammed. What makes you appreciate her even more is going back with the knowledge, knowing that she's there to scam them from the beginning. Sets yeah. herself up Knowing, as the biggest yep. dupe, you know, like yep. she trips in the in the lobby and everything else. They just just to oh, yeah. reel them in. And she does Scammer say, knows how to scam. Yeah. I made three million dollars last year, but your 50,000 was the most fun. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, this has got so many little moments. I mean, when they're trying to outdo each other, you know, to get to get her money and, and you know, uh, Freddie shows up in the wheelchair and the sailors got his back when the, <laughs> the Lawrence is taunting him from the dance floor. Yeah. You see, well, that is questionable about this. That's like the 80s questionable uh, content coming into play here where he's playing a disabled person right. and a mentally challenged person in the same movie. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> And he's still lovable. Just kind of weird. Something about Steve Martin's performance in this film reminded me a lot of this era of Bill Murray, where like he's very physical. He's like slightly stupid, but also slightly disdainful. And I could just see Bill Murray playing this part like no problem, just swapping out. It was it was so weird. Mm. Something about the way Steve Martin performed this particular part. I think, yeah, I think Steve Martin's a little more physical with his. Uh, I'm sure you well, read yeah, the fact that Eddie Murphy was set that this was right. this was his part to be. And had. this to me is quintessential Steve Martin because this is playing to his like jerk era yes, strength. Correct. You yes, know, very much so. Yeah, and the fact that he was reading. For Jameson, did you read the story where Richard Dreyfus came in to read for this part before Michael Caine no. was attached? Martin yeah. was reading for the part of Jameson, and Dreyfus was supposed to be reading for Freddie, 
but prepared for the part of Jameson. So then Martin had to switch tact and they realized, oh, well, we've got our Freddie already right here. Huh. Like I couldn't I could never picture Steve Martin as as Lawrence after seeing Michael Caine, especially right. as Lawrence. But yeah. you'd be wasting him, I think, playing the straight man. I'm assuming that Jagger would have played the Freddie part. Well, I don't know. You ever seen Jasmine for Blue Jean, the, the, the long <laughs> video? <laughs> that's enough to make you convinced that he would be a good Lawrence? He'd that's be a, a good deep, nerd. That's a, that's a deep yeah. take. That's a deep yeah, cut. That is, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a hot take right there. Yeah. I think yeah. Bowie would play the Freddy part, actually. And I think that Jagger would play the, the Lawrence part. Really? I don't That is that. my opinion. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Say you know, that. do you remember when the trailer came out? There's a scene where they're walking across the Riviera and they push an old lady into the water. That is not in this movie whatsoever, mm-hmm. but that has stuck with me. And I love that stuff. It's not That's an it. outtake. It's not something that, you know, that was on the end of a DVD. Yeah. That, that didn't, it, like, I it was, remember that trailer. I right, remember seeing that trailer. trailer. Like that's the scene that you, you're like, I now want to see this movie mm-hmm. because that's just a jerk. <laughs> and we've all wanted to do it. So, when the, I really love um, Andre, the absolutely corrupt police inspector. Um, he is one of my favorite lines in the movie when he tells Lawrence that he can have Freddie killed. He's like, I know, <laughs> I know a man and he's like an absolute magician and, you know, all this stuff. And he says, as police inspector, I can assure you the case will be investigated in a very slipshod manner. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even talk about Arthur yet. The emperor himself, Ian <laughs> McDermott. And he's very he's got some funny timing there. So. This is just so much fun. And the, you know, to your point, this is definitely a movie where, like the title says, they are dirty, rotten scoundrels. Yeah, and they, and they don't change. It. They they no. stay dirty, rotten scoundrels right to the end, yeah. and it's fine. <laughs> Hello, Chips O'Toole here. This is this is fun. I did see that Kane was nominated for best actor, but lost to Tom Hanks from In Big. Mm-hmm. So, if you're gonna lose to anybody, and they just seem like they're having fun. Yes, very much so. And Absolutely. poor Barbara Harris keeps getting pushed into ferns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was up with that? They just kept shoving her into the shrubbery over there. Yeah, I guess fun was the main selling point for Michael Caine, because once they approached him, I think the clincher was that he was going to be able to stay in his own French villa for three months. And then he realized he was right next door to Roger Moore, who was one of his best friends, Roger Moore's villa. So he's like, all right, Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Just before or after Jaws 4. Maybe he got a taste for that villa and he needed to pay for it. Exactly. That's why he took Jaws the Revenge. That may have been the house that that shark paid for. Yeah. Have either of you ever seen Bedtime Story? Because I have no, not. I see that. The I David have not either. Brando. A Brando movie, a Brando yeah. movie. No, and David Niven. Yeah. No, so I like, haven't seen it. Um, and Bedtime Story doesn't seem to be widely, widely available because I looked hmm. for it out of curiosity. I haven't seen And then it. this was remade, though, right? With uh, Sigourney Weaver and Jennifer Love Hewitt. Heartbreakers. I could be wrong. Hmm. I didn't actually do research. <laughs> I just wrote it down. <laughs> We're not 100% accurate on this show, folks. Take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, yeah, um, it was it was very well regarded by reviewers when it was released in 1988. The, the one review that stuck out to me was Vincent Canby of the New York Times. And he's not usually positive whenever we quote him on this show. But <laughs> he is here. But, Jeff, I don't think you're going to like this. Okay. Oh, boy. In a season of lazy, fat, mistimed and misdirected comedies exemplified by scrooged and twins dirty rotten scoundrels is an enchanted featherweight folly scrooge is lazy <laughs> i, I told on. you Come i on. told you twins i can't speak to because it's been a very long time since and he didn't he didn't, didn't just call it lazy fat as well i wonder if he reviewed nightmare alley is he still with us vincent canby <laughs> Did he... <laughs> He was in Nightmare Alley. It was a Broadway musical as well in 2005. I see that. Seems like it would make a fun musical. Yes. If the yeah. you know if they did a good job with the music, I've never seen or heard. I it, love but... the music in this, by the way. Yeah. It's got this jazzy monster zinc kind of uh, pep to it. I really do enjoy it. But yeah, unfortunately, all I think is Monster Zinc when I hear it. It does add to the fun of it all. And the other fun fact that that I read is that scene where Steve Martin is trying to remember Lawrence's name in the jail cell. Oh, yes. And he completely, just he's just completely ripping. improvised. And Oz had the actor playing Andre, Inspector Andre, 
interrupt him. Once Oz thought that Steve Martin couldn't take this joke any further, he, <laughs> he just cut him off, off camera. He nudged Inspector Andre to interrupt him. So to stop him. So that's exactly what happened. Oh, geez. There so, you yeah. go. I just looked up Heartbreakers. Max and Paige are a mother and daughter con team. Okay. Seduce wealthy men into marrying her. Then Paige seduces them into infidelity. So Max can rake them over the divorce court coals. So that has a weird- unnecessarily... <laughs> A uh, remake of this movie, but uh, it is in the same vein. That's kind of a gross concept. Don't you yeah, think? this is again this is Sigourney <laughs> Weaver and Jennifer Love Hewitt it came out in two thousand one. Where's where's my date? Two thousand one. All right, so I was uh, off, but not by much. So so I consider this one of the classics of I the eighties. Yeah. What kind of buckets would we give Dirty Ron Scoundrels? Four and a quarter. I'm gonna say four. I will go three and three quarters. And it was very nice to watch a movie with my son from the 80s and not be wary of anything. (laughs) Am I not remembering something in this? Is something going to come take me by surprise here? Nope. It was not at all. It was fine. Well, apparently we like our con men funny. Yeah. Well, you know, I I thought about the sting as a pair for this because that is the best con man story of all time again a hill i will die on but one of the things i liked about the symmetry of this was that in nightmare alley stan gets conned himself and the same thing happens here so that was part of the part of the consideration so con air was never considered con air was never considered (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so next week, are we revisiting Del Toro territory next week? What's He's a producer, week? I think, on this film. Yeah, we are. So Antlers is going to be our main feature next week. So we're Wendigo? delving back Wendigo? into the into horror territory. Great. <laughs> Can't wait. I was going to watch both of these today just to spare my wife. Don't watch them together. <laughs> what? I, ha- I just I, feel I... like Ravenous needs to stand alone. <laughs> 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 And that yes. will be the second feature. That will be our second feature, <laughs> Ravenous. Yeah, I've asked way too many questions on this. So now I'm, you, you've really piqued my curiosity because. because the, like, this is a, a cult favorite in my household. We love Ravenous. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really curious to they're know what you available, think of it. They're both available for rent on uh, Amazon Prime. So if anybody yeah. wants to uh, mm-hmm. watch along, yes. Come on uh, back next week. We'll be here. Okay. Bye. Bye. Hello, everybody. If you liked the podcast you just heard, then please follow TMI on all of our social media outlets. First and foremost, email us at tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. That is tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at TMI underscore podcast2018. Step over, say hi, give us a compliment. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram as well, which is also uh, TMI underscore podcast 2018. And of course, we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash TMI podcast 2018. And it should be noted, we also have a community page. So join the forum. And if you like to watch YouTube, you can see us at TMI podcast 2018, all one word. Look for the popcorn bucket. Popcorn bucket. Or you could just go to our website, which has every link there, TMI confessionals podcast.com. And we'll see you at the concession stand. We'll save some popcorn for you. Colonoscopy, Mm -hmm. Shout Factory. In that order.